Hi, welcome back. I'm Paul Tilley. This is Marketing Research. And today, we're going to be looking at primary research observation. Now, as you know, there are three types of primary research. There's survey type primary research that's conducted by surveys. We looked at that in the last unit. There's observational type primary research where you observe what's going on in a scientific way. That's what we're looking at in this unit. And the next unit, we'll look at experiments and how they can be used as a primary research tool. For right now, though, we're looking at Unit 6, Primary Research Using Observation. So without any further ado, let's take a look at what we're going to be looking at in, in this part of the course. First, we're going to discuss what can be observed and how that can be used in primary research. Next, we're going to look at the role of observation in market research. After that, we'll look at the differences between direct and so-called contrived observational research. Then we're going to identify some of the ethical issues. In fact, we'll look at some of the ethical issues with regards to observational research. And then we're going to take a look at various techniques that are used in observational research. First and foremost, we have to describe exactly what observation is. By definition, observation is a form of primary research that involves a process of systematically recording the behavioral patterns of people, objects, and occurrences as they are witnessed. So it's watching things as they evolve. And it could be people, it could be machines, it could be um, natural events. It could be any number of things, as long as we can observe them. So what can be observed? Well, generally we can break it down into a number of key categories. Physical actions, such as people's expressions and people's movement. Verbal behavior, let's say if I'm really loud. That would be a good example of a verbal behavior. Expressive behavior, that would be a form of expressive behavior. Spatial relations. Here's an example of a spatial relation. I'm up in your face. You're going to be upset. That's what we look at with regards to spatial relations. How can we measure how far people are from one another? How can we relate to how close one thing is to another thing? That's observable. We also look at temporal patterns. And when we look at temporal patterns, temporal is just a fancy word for time. We're looking at how things happen. If you think about day and night and the seasons, that, those are all temporal patterns. And we want to observe how things progress along in terms of time. We also look at verbal and pictorial records. If you think about a verbal record, well, this video is a good example of a verbal record. It is recording this, and no matter how many times you play it, and no matter how old I get or how many gray hairs, I'll look this way in this video for as long as the video lasts. So it provides a record of the way I was in October 2014. We also have pictorial records. If you look back at your old school pictures, just go back and look at them. When I look at mine, they look pretty scary. Maybe yours aren't so scary because you weren't in school that long ago. For me, I'm looking at 30 years distance between me and my school pictures, and as a result, I look quite a bit different. So those are important distinctions that we need to be aware of, and certainly are all very observable. I have a good graphic that comes right out of the book. Exhibit 8.1 uh, shows good examples of different types of observable things, be it physical, verbal, expressive, spatial, temporal, physical objects, verbal and pictorial records. We also talk about neurological activities, which is measuring brain waves and these sorts of things. Internet activity, this is a pretty common one now, especially when we look at things like Facebook. And uh, geographic information, and again, uh, using the internet and things like Google Maps, we can find a lot of things on Google that would be geographic type information. In terms of the basic categories of observation, we talk about things like human versus mechanical. Uh, if I sit on a street corner and watch traffic go by and I count it, that's a form of human observation. However, I could potentially have a camera there that's doing exactly the same thing and ticking off how many cars go by. That would be a form of mechanical observation. Uh, we also have visible and hidden observation. This camera that I'm looking into, for example, is very visible. I'm being observed. I'm looking at the camera right here now. It's, it's there. I, I can see it. But sometimes you go in buildings and the cameras are there watching you and you don't see them. That's a form of hidden observation. Hidden observation comes with a whole pile of ethical 
issues. If you know you're on camera, it's one thing. If you don't know you're on camera, it's something totally different. And that, that poses some challenges for observers, certainly, is, is this concept of hidden observation. We also have direct observation. Direct observation is looking at something happen directly, so it's not the form of indirect observation. It is looking at the event. And we have something called contrived observation. Contrived observation is sometimes when we set up a scenario. You can imagine actors on a TV show or on, in a movie would be a form of contrived. It is contrived. It's not real. But we can observe it all the same. So we can see people act out stunts or we can see people uh, pretend to get upset or uh, these sorts of things and watch how they react like a role play type situation is a form of contra contrived observation. We also think about things like nonverbal communication and so much of our communication is nonverbal. You're looking at my face here now and you're saying, what's he thinking? What's he thinking? Well, if I, I put on a happy face, uh, that would tell you one thing, if put on a sad face, that tells you something different. So again, we can look at all forms of nonverbal communication as being vastly beneficial to us because if we can see people, we can see so much more than what they're saying. We can actually see them. So we think about their facial expression, their body language, like I cross my things in here, you know, that's, that's a very different message that I'm getting if I'm, I'm sitting across from you straight and I've uh, got my arms open. Eye activity, you know, if I'm, I'm looking at you, however, if I look away like this and I tell you what's happening, you probably wouldn't believe me so much. So again, eye observation is important. Um, our personal space, again, if I'm in your face, that's just too much for most people, and that way they, they lose the message, so we need to be careful there with, with regards to that. And also if I roll too far away, even though I can't roll very far away here, uh, that would make a difference to how much you can, you can get out of the conversation. Gestures, that's common, and mannerisms. Uh, for example, if you shake someone's hand, and their hand is wet and limp, it, it tells you a lot about, do they really glad to see you, or are they just not so glad? There's all kinds of benefits to observing human behavior. When we think about it, well, it helps us get information about people and things because we don't really need to say anything. We just get a lot of information by observing. We can tell. So it doesn't require a respondent to do anything other than just do whatever they normally do. Uh, and there's no real distortions in the data. We, we see it as it is. You're, you're watching me. I, I can't distort it. I can't tell you I have a red shirt on. I have a blue shirt on. So you can't distort the data. Um, I don't need to rely on memory because I've recorded it. I'm watching you. I'm, I'm just, I can observe whether or not for example, if I ask you if you're happy and I look at your face and you kind of look like you're in a happy mood, I, I tend to believe you. So do that. Uh, certain data may be obtained more quickly. You know, we can watch traffic go by very quickly uh, and count it. Can be done fairly instantly. And if, if we use a machine, we can do it even more fast than that. Uh, environmental conditions could be recorded. For example, on a happy day, you're going to see me smiling so much more when the sun is shining than when it's not. And uh, it can be combined with other types of data as well. So we must remember that, that, for example, survey information and observational information can be coupled together and one would kind of support the other. Uh, some of the limitations to observing human behavior need to be considered as well. We think about um, cognitive phenomena. Uh, now, cognitive phenomena is what's going on inside my brain. So there's a little voice inside my head. You cannot hear it. I can Okay? So you can't really record that little voice inside of people's heads. So that cognitive ability or cognitive activity is not really picked up by observation. Uh, interpretation of data might be a bit of a problem. You might perceive, I am giving you a signal through my body language, that might be actually wrong. You may perceive the wrong thing. So, you know, there are some room for errors. Not all activity can be recorded. For example, you can't see my feet. You can't record that, but in other, but there are other things that just can't be observed. Like you know, uh, if, if you're watching people doing things, well, why are they doing them? These, not necessarily do you have the big picture of what's going on. Um, only short periods can be observed. You can't absorb someone forever. Uh, observational bias is possible. There is some opportunity for the observer potentially to impact what's being observed or why why things are going on. And then we have the issue of invasion of privacy and the, the um, 
the ethical issues that come up observation. Uh, next we kind of look at the different types of things that are observed. Physical objects are observed. You can actually see things. So as you watch traffic go by or if you watch houses being built or if you watch people pass by, um, these are all observable. But physical objects, we can certainly take a look at them. We can see them. We can measure them. We can tap them. We can do whatever you need to do in order to observe it. Um, they, they talk about trace evidence and physical wear. You go into a library, you look at the bookshelf. You can tell which books have been taken out, which ones haven't, just based on wear alone. Uh, so just take a look at that. Look at the, the, the book. Uh, for example, my, my little notebook here that I keep, you can see that's kind of frayed. I use that quite a bit. Whereas, uh, whereas if I had something else, here's a book that just came out of its wrapper a little while ago. Okay. This book came out of its wrapper. See what kind of damage I can do here? And you look at the spine of that book. It's not hurt because I haven't used it. This other book is rather new. This is a new version of a book. You can see that I have some use of it. But I have an earlier version of the book here on the shelf. This is an earlier version of that same book. And you can see, look, I have it. I have it dog-eared and it's kind of torn, so observational research could tell you how much I've used that book. Great book. Okay, so uh, that's physical objects. We also have scientifically contrived observation. This is when we, we could set up a little scenario. You've seen those TV shows where, you know, um, America's Funniest Videos or um, something just for laughs videos where they contrive a situation. So, for example, they, they, they glue a quarter to the floor and they try to watch people pick it up and see what effect it is. That's a form of contrived observation or people acting in a role play. That, that's a form of contrived observation. We also have something called content analysis. Content analysis looks at what is the content in things. Um, let's take a bag of your garbage. Let's just go now and think about the bag of garbage that's in your garbage bucket. So if you've got a garbage bucket handy, take a look in it. So I'll, I'll, here's mine. Okay, I have a garbage bucket. And if you look in the garbage, you'll see what people throw out. And based on what they throw out, you can tell what, what they do. So if I were to look at a bag of household garbage, for example, and I were to rip it open and find lots of diapers in there and tea bags and, uh, and toys, I can make an assumption that uh, they have small children or not uh, uh, potty trained. Uh, I can make an assumption that they're tea drinkers, and I can make an assumption that they probably have older kids who are moving on to different types of toys or toys are gone. So that, that would be a form of, of observation where we look at the actual content of what's inside the bags. We could also take a look at newspapers. We could measure how much advertising is in a newspaper versus how much news. We could just measure the square footage, for lack of a better term, the, the amount of space that's dedicated to ads and the amount of space that's dedicated to news stories, and we can kind of calculate uh, what we got there in terms of a news-to-ad ratio. Um, we also have uh, something called response latency is another thing that can be measured. It's not actually measuring the response, it's measuring how long it takes for the response. If I offered you two identical things, let's say for example I offered you this pen here or this pen here. Now you're going to take a look at that and you're going to say, well I want this one here. You want this one here. And you say it very quickly, I love blue pens. What I'm measuring is not really your choice of the pen, but what I'm measuring is how much you think that this pen is good for you. Uh, how much you like it actually. The fact that you jumped on it really quick and said I want that blue pen means to me, says to me, that you really like that blue pen and that you feel very strongly about it. If, if it took you a long time, if I held both of them up and you said, oh, I don't know, you're not going to decide, there's no real big deal, I'm indifferent to it. I could say then that Really, realistically, neither of the things really appeal to you to any great extent. It's a pain, big deal. Uh, whereas if you grab it really quickly and say, yeah, I really like that pen, what I'd be measuring is, is how long it took you to, to actually uh, want to get that. We also have all kinds of mechanical observation. Mechanical observation is used quite a bit out there. If you think about counting machines or you go to a bank. I was watching the other day, I was in the bank and they, were, uh, they put a bunch of money in this machine and it, it folds it and counts the money very quickly. That's a form of mechanical observation. How fast can it count the money? Uh, traffic counters, web traffic counting, um, scanners like in Walmart. Um, these are all examples of, of scanners. 
Uh, we also have uh, something called physiological measures where we can actually measure people. Um, for example, uh, take my temperature and you can tell if I'm sick or not. Okay, or if uh, if you hang, I put a little um, a machine on me, a lie detector, put on my finger. Uh, depending on whether I'm telling the truth or not, would would it would be? I'd start to sweat basically if I wasn't telling the truth, and the electric current would conduct through my finger more readily, and the machine would say you're lying just based on how much uh, electricity flowed through my finger. Uh, that would be an interesting one. Uh, web traffic. If you look at Facebook, Facebook is a wonderful tool, but Facebook, uh, the back end of Facebook for companies is that it can measure web traffic very easily. And uh, I've got a little slide up here, for example, this is a, a, a site I own in our town of Clarenville, and you can see uh, it measures like, for example, page likes, uh, post reach, and it will give me all kinds of information with regards to how many people actually viewed something that I posted. Um, we also can measure physiological reactions of people. You know what, what kind of tools are out there? Well, we got things like an eye tracking measure. You watch my eye if I'm shifty eyed, or if, for example, my pupil is dilated or not. That can all indicate several things. I don't know what those things are, but it, oh, it's a good indicator of lying or interest or things like that. Um, we also got the psychogalvanometer, which is really the lie detector, which I just described. And uh, voice pitch analysis. Uh, if you, for example, I don't know if you've got a computer that allows you to see little waves go by or uh, little VH meters or VF meters that, that show every time I talk. For example, if I speak higher, the meter will go high. If I speak lower, the meter will go lower. And um, just by judging people's voice pitch, you can determine a bunch of things with it. Essentially, though, you know, when you think about observation, uh, one of the, the key things that should jump into your mind is, yeah, it's a useful tool. However, there are some ethical issues with observation, and we really need to be, take care whenever we do observation to ensure that we've met some ethical guidelines. And, and Exhibit 8.3 that I'm just putting up on the screen now kind of shows some of the, the questions that we should ask. Like, for example, is the behavior commonly performed in public? where others can plainly see it. Well, if, if we're watching something that's publicly seeable anyway, publicly viewable, such as traffic on that road, there's really no major ethical consideration for that. It, it's open for the world to see. Uh, if it's not something that we normally do in public, then we have to ask ourselves, is this ethical? Uh, we also think about, is the behavior performed in a, a setting in which anonymity is assured? Um, you'll notice Google, if you ever go to Google Earth and you look at uh, the Google Street View. Uh, they always um, blot out the uh, any cars that show the uh, license plate is blotted out, and, and any identifiable things that relate to people are all blotted out or fuzzied out. Uh, Google's done that only because of several complaints from people saying, "Hey, you know, there's an invasion of privacy going around doing the, the Google the Google thing." And I'll just show you a little picture of of an example of that there now. You can see that this particular car in the graphic you can see that the uh, license plate is kind of grayed out there. Um, has the person agreed to be observed is another thing. You know, if, if the person's been agreed to be observed then we're pretty good. If the person hasn't agreed, mm, we're, we're running some grayness. This is great when you take pictures of people, for example. And the other thing that we need to concern is has the person been adequately notified that the behavior is being observed. If we tell people they're being observed then we could say yeah, we're pretty good. For example, on this premises, as you come in there, it says there's electronic viewing, uh, electronic monitoring of this campus. Uh, there's an example of telling people they're going to be observed. Those are the key things in this chapter. Um, I, I take a chance now to review it all and make sure you ask any questions if there are any. Uh, I thank you for being with me today. See you later.